Hey guys, Greg here, and today I'm really, really excited to have a special treat for you. I'm gonna be unboxing and reviewing a Ghostbusters Proton Pack that I commissioned back in December, and I have a special guest coming on with me as well, the leader of the NorCal Ghostbusters. He also has a pack. We're gonna compare them, uh, you know, look at them, see their differences. We're also gonna tell you how to get into this hobby, what is this hobby in general, and what the heck these Ghostbuster chapters exactly do. So stick around, you won't want to miss this. Let's get ready. Switch me on. Hey guys, Greg here, and I have a very, very special guest with me today, Chris. Chris, how are you doing today? Pretty good, how are you doing, Greg? So, I'm doing great, and you are the head of the NorCal, well, I, you, you don't call yourself that, I feel you're officially the head of the Northern California Ghostbusters. Uh, uh, I think my official title is Experimental Equipment Technician. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I am the co-founder of Northern California Ghostbusters. So for people who are unfamiliar with what exactly these chapters, because they exist all over the world, you know, you have Sacramento Ghostbusters, Detroit Ghostbusters, LA Ghostbusters, what are these chapters or divisions of Ghostbusters? Uh, so it's just kind of a bunch of fan groups that have kind of come together over love of the franchise and wanting to build the gear and kind of go out into the community and do good things wherever we can. Uh, a lot of it is just kind of coming together and finding friends from around the world, too. Uh, so because of the hobby, actually, we've made friends from pe with people all over the United States, from the UK. Uh, I know you were listening to some of Ecto Crank's music earlier. We actually met at in person at FanFest as well. <laughs> and he's he's from Essex uh, or He's probably going to kill me if I if I get that wrong. <laughs> Wales, I think, actually. Essex or Wales? It's yeah, so they're 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 both in in the UK, so you know, I got that much right. They're all nonprofit organizations, and some are bigger than others. And you do kind of good work. You do a lot of uh, charity work, like people that go to go to hospitals or go to like like you know uh, public events and kind of just make appearances yeah. and spread basically information about the fandom in general. Yeah, and I think probably one of the more famous recent things was the Sacramento Ghostbusters uh, uh, worked with the Make-A-Wish Foundation to do a whole takeover of Old Town Sacramento for a kid uh, and, and basically make him a Ghostbuster for the day. And uh, so there's a lot of charitable work that, uh, that fan franchises do uh, and a lot of just uh, going out in the public and, and you know, making people smile too. So going to public events, going to conventions, going to uh, uh, street fairs and that sort of thing. It's almost like it's almost like a, just a big, like basically a community of you spreading the fandom and the love of the franchise to other people. Definitely, definitely. Especially at this point because I think we're starting to get to people's grandchildren are you know second third generation in a row Ghostbusters at this point? So now, how does one like how how do we find more information? Say I'm in like you know Los Angeles. How do I find a chapter and join them? And what's the, what are the requirements? What do I need? So all the different franchises are because we don't really have any overarching organization that sort of sets policies for every group. Every group is kind of individual. Uh, generally, they're going to be very geographically based. The easiest places to look are going to be on good old Facebook and social media, and then uh, gbfans.com, which actually is where I bought a lot of the parts for my Proton Pack. So Yeah, I mean, that's where I found you. I found you yeah. on Facebook. I think I messaged you on Facebook. I was like, hi, what is this? What do I do? And you kind of brought me into this in incredible world. It really is an interesting, friendly, surprisingly friendly world. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah especially after 2016, <laughs> uh, a lot of us uh, uh, didn't want to be gatekeepers to the community. And so we want we want people to come in. We want to you know encourage a new generation to kind of to pick up the neutrona wand and go out there and fight some ghosts alongside some of their best friends. And that's that's really what it kind of comes down to. So obviously the hobby, there's a lot of things you can you can make and have. Obviously the flight, we're wearing the flight suits. We have the patch. We have you know you you brought everything with you. You you don't you're not wearing boots right now. We have you have the boots. We have the elbow pads, uh, the name tag, pins, kind of everything. But the biggest kind of centerpiece of any costume, I would assume would be the Proton Pack. Definitely, yes. The centerpiece for most people is gonna be the Proton Pack. A lot of people tend to start with the Proton Pack and then if they are gonna build the other props, they, go, they do them after the pack. Uh, because usually the pack is the hard part and then you do the easy part later.
So now we're gonna go over basically guys the pack itself because there are multiple It's it's actually an overwhelming amount of things you can buy where you can buy them the parts you can buy there's there's a dozens and dozens of different parts kits uh, resin cast uh, 3d print models blueprints and we're gonna kind of go over uh, my pack that I commissioned and then the pack that Chris spent the latter half of his year building and making himself from multiple sources and we're kind of going to compare the two uh, talk about the differences obviously you know in price and quality and construction uh, and most importantly how you can build one and maybe what it fits best for you in general if you want to actually join the Ghostbusters group and build a proton pack so let's get right into it so guys right now we're looking at Chris's custom built proton pack that you built this out of multiple parts correct on multiple yeah. kits yeah uh well uh didn't generally most of the parts did not come as kits uh only a few things came as packages uh otherwise it was bought all generally piecemeal and assembled so talk about like where do you where, where does someone start with a pack of this quality like where do you what's the starting point uh so the starting point uh for me at least was the shell so a majority of the actual physical construction that you see of the proton pack is this fiberglass shell and this is all a single piece that has actually been cast and fiberglassed and given a gel coat and everything uh, and then I've gone through and actually drilled all of the mounting holes for the pieces that go onto the shell. And that's not something you, that's something you order, right? The, fi yes. the fiberglass shell, and the, the, the rest, sorry, it's fiberglass, right? Yes, it's a fiberglass shell and it's, uh, the one that I have is from the GB Fans store. Uh, you can very easily go there and get one yourself for about 300, I believe. Uh, but if that's too rich for you, there's plenty of other options too. Yeah, there, that's the one thing. There are a ton of options. I commissioned mine. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody else built it. No one designs. Garrett built mine. Yours is a little more complicated in the sense that some places do offer kits, but they're not full compatible kits. It may be just base and then some of the wires, but like then you have like these little these little all, things on all, the side. All of the little uh, uh, resistors, resistors and, and all knobs of the little... Why am I blanking on this? Uh, <laughs> all the little fittings and things. Yeah. Yes. So like you can't. So there is, as as far as you know, there's no like place you can go to just buy a kit that has literally everything you can buy. One place, get it and put it together. Not in this quality. There's things like Anovos, though. I would generally caution people from buying any kits from Anovos in general because they don't have a great track record in terms of fulfillment. But for the most part, you're never going to find a complete kit that has all of these like these real clipboard fittings or these real Legree elbows included. They're gonna be ca resin cast or 3D printed. And all that stuff is, it's all personal preference. I mean, you don't have to get like a, a real, I mean, I'm sure you could find the real clip arts in the wild, but I'm sure they're very expensive and hard to find. The vintage ones are extremely difficult to find. I've seen a few guys do builds where they very specifically take their time and pick out only vintage things, even down to vintage Nicoil tubing which would have been the original vintage brand of tubing that they used on the movie props. That is ridiculous. It takes somewhere <laughs> between five to 10 years just to track everything down. I spent three years putting this sucker together and even that was too long for my taste. Now it took you three years and how much did you spend overall in, in parts, not including the time, but just in parts just to build what you see right here? Uh, in terms of parts, I think uh, I did the math somewhat recently and I came out around 2850 all told. So just shy of three grand. But that's, but that's over a period, you didn't spend $2,800 all at once. It no. was It was a period <laughs> over four, uh, three years, you slowly got better parts and newer parts and added them on and fix them up yourself right exactly exactly and some of that was waiting time on commission of parts as well certain things like my gun is a fully aluminum machined gun and that actually took like four or five months in terms of I had to order it and then wait for the commission to be put together as opposed to like most of the other guns which are either resin cast or 3d printed correct those, those are gonna be the more common ones that you see on people in the convention scenes yeah Obviously you have all the external stuff, you know, you have your, your parts up here and your wires and your everything like that, but inside the pack, it actually has lights. Can you turn it on for us? Oh, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> so tell us what's going, so now, now, we can, now you can turn the sound on with a, you can turn the sound down on your pack as well, right? Uh, yes, but I'd actually have to open the whole thing up to get yeah. to the, the potentiometer. However, <laughs> I can do this. 
So you guys can see the lights right now. So talk about what's going on in the inside of this pack right now. So right now I'm using what's uh, the same electronics board kits that you can get on the GB Fan shop. Uh, they're all made by this guy, Sponge Face McGee, who uh, is pretty popular and well-known for uh, the mod kits that you can get made by him for the Spirit of Halloween Proton pack. Uh, obviously, this is a full-size one. <laughs> Sponge Face McGee. Sponge Face McGee sounds like an old man who, like, you know, won't give back your frisbee. Uh, I know. That you get down and, to his lawn. But in, instead, it turns out that he's actually a very nice man from Colorado who does some great work, work with electronics and has got great customer service. So, like, when I when I first met you, we were ta I was talking about one of the things because. I was really hesitant because inside the pack there's a lot of electronics and wires and batteries and I've never been one to code and there are people out there who do code like their own, you know, you know, this thing on the side or the cyclotron lights on the bottom, like they all, that has to code. But you were telling me that, no, GB Fans makes boards that are pre-corded and all you have to yep. do is plug and play. Exactly. That's the electronics kit that I have in my pack right here, which actually I believe it's the exact same kit that you're using in your pack. So it's all plug and play gear. The lights, you just kind of have to figure out how to physically mount them in place. And that's about the most strenuous part of it. And usually that just means hot glue. What was, <laughs> what was the hardest part about making your pack overall? I think probably working the fiberglass shell, there was a little bit of a learning curve and there are some places like, and I think I was telling you about this off camera earlier, Greg, like on this corner right here, I completely shattered it in the course of drilling holes for these fittings. And so uh, this is all completely rebuilt out of uh, milliput, two-part epoxy. It's a type of two-part epoxy clay. Uh, so I actually, you know, there's a few spots on here where it was like I either drilled my spot, my hole for the part crooked or, and I had to go back and refill it and redrill things or I just completely shattered tiny chunks out and I had to go back over it and rebuild the whole shape itself. So there, there is like even, even though there's a ton of support on GB fans and a lot of stuff that you can look up it is try it's, it's still there's trial and error sometimes with a hobby that, like this definitely definitely so like you said this comes in a kit now you recommend when i was considering building one you recommended me there was a british a uk developer who makes just basically all the extremities ba uh, and the he, wand uh, that, yeah, that well, come in a kit the ben of kent kit yeah yes uh, ben of kent makes some very amazing proton packs and proton pack kits uh, they're primarily 3D printed and resin cast, and actually, uh, I believe the kits that I was pointing you towards were complete kits, so it would be everything. But not the electronics, it's good Not the electronics. But everything external. Everything like. external. None of the fittings would be real, they'd be all resin cast and 3D printed, but if you do a good enough job with the painting, like, you can't tell. <laughs> See, I think that's the big difference between your pack and my pack, is, is a lot of the stuff, I mean, you, everything that looks metal is actually metal or aluminum. Mm -hmm. Whereas some people will 3D print theirs, or some uh, people will, you know, pat plastic and paint it over. But like, I mean, that's just preference for you, right? Just whatever yeah. level you're comfortable with, or however much detail you want in the pack. Exactly. Uh, when I started out building mine, that was one of my build maxims, was I wanted it to feel like a real piece of equipment when I picked it up. Uh, so I built it as hefty and uh, as I could, and so it does feel like a real piece of scientific equipment. That said, it's almost 30 pounds, and wearing <laughs> it for eight hours straight is pretty rough. So talk about, like, where do people find these stickers? Obviously, these are all stickers you see exactly from the so, films. So uh, most of the labels are from GB fans, except for, I think, the three cut metal stickers, which are from GB fans, but they were originally made by Joe Luna from the SoCal Ghostbusters. So, so just as best by GB fans, it's it's not only a resource and a form, but also, like, a store? They have a web shop as well. Uh, there's the website and the web shop, and the website is generally kind of a news aggregator, uh, although there's a lot of great resources and reference material there as well uh, that I used a lot actually throughout this whole build because uh, you know, why reinvent the wheel? Uh, if somebody's already sat down and gotten the screen captures of Dan Aykroyd's Proton Pack in Ghostbusters 2 from this weird angle here and I need to see this little part here, I'm just going to go look it up there. <laughs> So let's talk about the wand for a second. All right, so your wand is, is very special. Instead of being a resin cast or a 3D print wand, your wand is almost made entirely out of aluminum, custom cut aluminum. Yeah, custom cut and machined aluminum by CPU64, who's uh, actually been a part of the Ghostbusters community so long, there are parts on the Proton Pack that he came up with the name for. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. okay, all yeah. right. So, so CPU64 is kind of a long heritage within the fan community. 
uh, and he does some amazing work. He's definitely on the more pricey side if you're looking at aluminum wand bodies, but uh, you could go, you could do worse. Now, how much was just the aluminum wand that he shipped to you? Uh, I believe it came out to about two fifty three hundred dollars for just the wand body, the grips, and I believe that includes included the instrument trigger bar back here and the uh, front cylinder as well. So pretty much the primary shapes of the. Uh, of the wand itself. Now, so people aren't confused, like the wand doesn't ship to him like this, guys. Like he, it comes completely aluminumized, but there's none of the lights, are the lights and buttons on it? No, no everything is it was, off. It was just a complete blank, basically. So there's like holes. So everywhere you see a light, there was basically a hole that either he drilled or you had to drill. It was, most of it was pre-drilled. Uh, in some cases, like most specifically with like these knobs here, like, the hole that was pre-drilled uh, did not match the hardware that came with the knob. So I had to go back and actually drill out the hole myself and open things up so that it would actually fit the hardware. I, I don't even know how you got all the wires in there. I've talked to you that before. That sounds like it's a very- <laughs> It's a rat's nest in rat's there. Rat's <laughs> nest of wiring and connectors, but it's all, you also, it's all A to B, C to D, E to F. Exactly. It's all very simple. It looks very intimidating, but anyone, if they sit down and just focus on it can do it. Exactly. It just kind of takes time. And uh, the best piece of advice that I got on the GB fans forums, actually, when I started building this was, uh, you know how to eat an elephant, right? <laughs> One bite at a time, ma'am. <laughs> One bite at a time. All right. <laughs> That never gets old. No. <laughs> That's sense. And I don't know, is, is my end filter in the shot here? Cause... No, it's not. Well, it might be. It, it's gonna... So like, and like you said, everything you, you kind of like, it's it's almost like a like a Lego castle. You're like building on to the pack itself, correct? So like correct. this, that, that smoke effect we just saw, that's something that came much later that you added into the pack. Correct, uh, yeah. And that was actually something that came plug and play to plug, that uh, it came designed to just sort of plug and play with the electronics that I already had. So it was a relatively easy installation. So you can make it, you can make, basically what you're telling me is you can make this as difficult as possible or you can make it as easy as possible because there are parts from the community that are made to intermingle and work with another, like you mentioned, the uh, Electronics Insider specific brand that work with this add-on flawlessly. Correct. Yeah, they're all, it's, uh, uh, in spite of being from two different sources, essentially, yeah, they're, uh, uh, that's kind of one of the big things within the fan community, actually, especially within the online component. Uh, a lot of us builders don't really get competitive, but we do egg each other on to do bigger, crazier things, which is how you've, I believe you've mentioned seeing like the Fincher Technologies Phoenix pack, where it does the full venting sequence from the video game and yeah. everything pops out. It's very, very cool. Very complex. And very expensive if it and, ever comes, because it's all custom, it's all custom made. Yes, yes, every part of that is custom machined aluminum basically to make it do those things. So your pack, three years at around $2,800, everything had to be painted, plugged in yourself. I mean, this all comes gray, right? Gray or yellow, whoever uh, the casting is. Or... Uh, it's, it's kind of like a dark black gray. It's okay. not too far off from the final color. Uh, yeah, I did have to completely repaint everything. Some of that is from do, to do the texture coat. I don't know how well it's showing in the lighting here. But you can see it has, it's not just flat, there's a texture to it. Yeah. I can feel it, I can feel the texture. It feels rough, like sandpaper kind of. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea. Is, uh, the, the screen use packs had some texture to them and a little bit of difference in the paint quality between the different parts. So now we're gonna take a look at mine. I'm gonna move mine on the screen. Mine's a little bit different. I. Uh, I was very intimidated by Chris when I first met him because all this stuff looked really cool and I was like, oh my God, I have to put it all to yourself. And he kept saying, it's easy, it's easy. And I did not believe him. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I ended up commissioning my pack from a, a, a Garrick from No One's Design. Him and his wife are prop models out in Arizona and I actually did a quick interview with him, which you can see right now. Hi, I'm Garrick Backer and I am one half of the company No One's Designs. So talk about a little bit how you got into proton pack building. When did you get into creating the proton pack? Oh man, that is been that was a project that actually sat in a box for years. Um, I we made one pack. I want to say almost ten years ago. I was right after we got married, I think. And it was the, I had bought. Uh, a set of bucks, um, which bucks are the form that you use to vacuum form. And uh, my friend at the time had a very small vacuum form table and we kind of made it work. It, 
it was very soft and we used the wrong kind of plastic, but put that away, sat for years uh, because I didn't have a vacuum form table, um, had a falling out with that friend so didn't have access to it anymore. And then um, when I was really starting to think about trying to pivot to do this full time, I was going through the properties that I had. And I mean, before the Proton Pack, the majority of my pieces sold somewhere between $75 on the low end and maybe 300 or more on the high end. And realistically, I would either need to do a lot more volume or I would need a higher dollar item. And so kind of, I was like, oh, I have a proton pack. I really like Ghostbusters and I've learned so much since then. So literally built the vacuum former so I could do it again, um, along with doing some armor and some other things, but pulled it all out, started going over it, uh, replaced a bunch of the parts, um, cleaned it, cut up, cleaned up the, uh, the bucks, basically rebuilt probably over 50% of them because they, they weren't sized quite right. Uh, and then, yeah, it started looking into all the different pieces, either making them by hand. Um, I did I do very little 3D modeling, um, but basic shapes are pretty easy to 3D model. So the my resin pieces are a mix of either things that I have personally 3D modeled or things that I have scratch built. Um, and yeah, it's once I realized that I could do it all in house and do it at a competitive price, that was the that was kind of like the reason that I got into it. Also, Ghostbusters is one of my favorite things when I was a kid. I loved the cartoon, so uh, I definitely had the passion to do all the work correctly. Uh, oftentimes, the people that buy my packs tend to be the ones that are working with uh, in any number of the Ghostbuster charity groups. There's usually at least one per state, if not more. Um, and they want something that's going to be lightweight so they can wear it all day. Because that's the other thing too, is that a vacuum form pack, you know, my pack weighs in and around the 20 pounds, 15 to 20 pounds. A fiberglass pack with all the bells and whistles and stuff, you can be looking at 30, some, and if you get aluminum parts, even 40 pounds on your back. So, you know, it's a it's a balancing game. I, I think I found a niche in that market um, that wasn't being catered to. And um, yeah. We actually took your pack and put it side by side, a custom made one that had an aluminum wand that did weigh about 32 pounds. <laughs> and like, and he was actually, he was very impressed by the, the amount of, of work that was on it. Like he was, he was expecting something less. Uh, of course, he's like, I think I, I consider him the elitist of ghost of the ghost heads. You know, he looks at something and goes, I know exactly what's wrong with that. I'm gonna, I, that's wrong. That's not the right size. But I opened up, I put it on, everything worked. I was ecstatic. And like mm -hmm. I said, he was very uh, impressed by how it didn't break in transit, how it was packed, how everything is very close to his pack. I think the biggest difference that he saw was just that it was vacuum form. So it's a tad, you, the details are a tad less standout and the, the motherboard was just ever so much thinner. Just, just you'd have yep. to pull out like a microscope than, than his, but that again, it comes back to weight. As you can see, it's hanging, it's, I got it to hang on my wall. So it's right in the back. So I was really excited about that. <laughs> um, so where do you like, so you had to, so let's talk about the vacuum form for a minute. You had to like carve your own parts out of wood as yeah, like a master, right? Yep, yep, they are, um, I think, yeah, every single part is built out of just scrap lumber um and that's not the, the problem when you do that is that woods have different densities so when you go to sand it if you have two different densities next to each other one will sand deeper than the other so there's also a lot of uh, epoxy spot fill <laughs> on it too to, to even it out on the masters um but yeah, yeah, you have to go through uh, quite a bit of effort to true all that up. And then you have to figure out where you can hide the air holes because part of the process for vacuum forming is if you want an area to be crisper and detailed, you need to put holes in it so it sucks down. So I had to figure out, all right, so this area is going to be covered by a, a resin piece. So I can drill holes right here to help suck it down and then it'll be hidden once the uh, the packs are all assembled. 
So there's a lot of design that goes into that. Um, also, how it's going to come out of the plastic. Obviously, it's a, you know, it's a sheet that comes down and gets sucked around a form. If you have undercuts, it will grab, uh, uh, lock into the plastic and you won't be able to get it out. So my pack is actually, the bucks I think are in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pieces and they are assembled, pulled, and then I can take them out one at a time from the back, which makes it much easier to uh, get out and uh, not damage the plastic while I'm doing that. Uh, any particular reason you chose vacuum for me? Because you are familiar with resin cast. You've done them before with some of your products. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I it's, It was a um, ease of use, time, and cost. Uh, when I was deciding to do the packs, there already were several other pack makers out there that offered uh, fiberglass shells. There was an idea that I could take the wooden bucks that I have, clean them up, and do a fiberglass shell that way. Um, but that meant that I wasn't, it, I would be competing on their terms. I think it was a it, it was a better choice for me to go with the vacuum forming because as far as I know, there's only one other company that produces vacuum form shells on a regular basis, and I don't think they do finished pieces. I think they just sell the shell kits. So part of it was the market research that I did. Also, I really like vacuum forming. I think it's a really cool process. I don't think enough people give it the kind of credit it deserves. I mean, it's what the stormtrooper armor was made out of. Um, so that you know combined with price it's also much cheaper to build uh vacuum form pieces than to do an entire mold for a fiberglass shell i mean just in silicone alone you're probably looking at two to three hundred dollars investment just to do that um it didn't even cost me that much to build my entire table and silicone wears out your molds will eventually die which means you have to do it again unless i break it or it catches fire, my wooden bucks are ever gonna wear out. I generally use the GB fans uh, electronics or build my own uh, because not GB fans is stock sometimes always isn't there, but uh, It's but also yeah. more expensive, try to keep the cost low because your your stuff's low. So if you program, like I think on your, your prop video, you program your own board, which was what, $4 or something, like on a fry or something? Exactly, it's a little, uh, little, um, but I, oh, the micro bit, the BBC micro bit. Yes, it was designed for children to use. So it was at the exact level that I needed it to be. Um, but yeah, yeah, in the video we, we did that. Um, I believe in your pack actually, not only do you have the GB fans sound kit, but also the light kit for the wand and for the cyclotron. Um, when I can buy those, I do because they have, my, again, I, I'm programming a board for a child. Um, so I can't get all of the neat effects that the uh, GB fan boards have. Um, so it'll go back and forth. And I usually tell people that up front because I try to keep stock in uh, on pieces. So um, I'll usually tell people, hey, you know, my standard is built with this, but right now I have this in stock, so you're getting an upgrade. What's also cool is that if if we, if we opened your pack in the back, since you're using the GB fans board, you can easily add the other things like the, like the smoke ventilator if you wanted to, because it's plug and play literally, because you're using the same electronics. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they do a good job of uh, kind of streamlining the whole electronic process, because it used to be, I have out in my shop some of the older kits. Man, it's, talk about, a nightmare <laughs> trying to wire it all together making sure that your leads are right making sure that you're not you know you haven't flipped a ground and so it's now constantly firing whenever you turn it on i've had that happen before <laughs> it's such a low price point compared to other builds and like not only that but you offer free shipping on something that weighs 20 pounds um yeah <laughs> it's it's actually really really impressive and as a matter of fact i chose you based on based on three three factors one was uh, your price point. Obviously, it was the lowest price point I saw for a completed pack. No, it didn't have the rumbler in it or two speakers or the smoke kit, but that was fine. I didn't need that. Second was um, when I reached out to you in December, you were very uh, professional about answering any questions I had. Here's what the pack's weighs. Here's what it includes. Here's how everything works. If you have any questions, let me know. 
And the third thing was actually, the third and deciding factor was your punished props video. Is uh, There's a lot of studios that, that have them and have like little like 60 second trailers, but not an in-depth, here's how I make it start to finish. That video is what really sold me. Here's how he makes it. Here's what he does. And this and it was so clear. I was like, I need, this is the guy I want to, I want to commission. Yeah. And it's, oh man, that was, we filmed that video and in one week, that was a, that was the fastest I have ever put a pack together. And we kind of cheated. I built the wand beforehand. Um, so, uh, or no, I shouldn't say completely built it. I cast all the pieces, did all the assembly and cleanup. So it was just like, and like a baking show, here's the wand, uh, because that could have been a whole video on its own. So yeah, that, that video, um, it did really well. I did not, I mean, Bill is a great guy. His channel is phenomenal. He's been um, a pioneer when it comes to doing like video content, um, really in-depth instructional video content on how to do all of this stuff. I was a, you know, a fan of his um, before we worked together. And yeah, it's, uh, it definitely really helped. <laughs> That's amazing, Gary. Thank you so much again for talking with me today. And go to guys, go to his site, look at his stuff, reach out, get a quote on something. If you need something made, you know, you know, or just buy one of his kits because you know what? It's you're at stuck at home. You know, build something yourself, spray it, learn how to do it. You know that kind of thing. Definitely. So, Gary, thank you so much again, man. It was a pleasure talking to you. And stay safe and healthy. You as well. Have a good one. <laughs> Sir, what you had there was what we refer to as a focused, non-terminal repeating phantasm or a class 5 full roaming vapor. Real nasty one too. So hey guys, now this is my commission pack that I bought from Garrick. You just saw an interview with him and how his process works. Um, overall, I was very happy with this pack that I bought. It was $1,300, so it was about half of what your pack cost and everything was already put together. Yeah. <laughs> now that said, it's not like, um, obviously there, it's not really a comparison thing. I mean, this, yours one, yours had a secret ingredient. Yeah. Love. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, it's I mean, built you- Built with love. Built with love. And fissionable material. <laughs> and fissionable material. Where'd you get that plutonium? Did you rip that off? As you can see, like, as you can see now, like, it's very similar to his pack. There are a lot, because obviously this is a GB1 pack. I mean, because there's actually two versions. We didn't talk about this. Yeah. Two versions of the pack. Um, but everything is very similar. There are some small details. Mine still does light up, if I can remember how to turn it on. So mine does have the noise, and it has all the lights and stuff. His does mine, mine does all the yeah, same lights. It's, all it's the, same the lights. exact same electronics kit that mine uses for the bass, for the sounds and lights. Basically, the biggest difference of your pack and this pack, particularly, is construction and materials. Yeah. So there's different things. So I can tell you right now, like I was really happy with the texture looks good. Everything looks good. Uh, the heavy weathering is a little, it's just on the stickers. Like there are, it's just, it's little things that are the difference. Like this sticker is a little too big. Right. Compared right. to yours. But that's like, like I said, uh, for $1,300, it's not bad though. Right. And well, and it's also just a flat foil cut sticker, like most of the other stickers on here. But you know, that's that's not bad. And to the layman's eye, that's not gonna stand out to anybody. Um, he, his communication is, granted there was COVID happening and a lot of things were going ahead. His communication was less to be desired, but that was the only thing I'd hit him for when we opened it. I mean, I have a lot of footage I'll show over this as we opened it. We were both very impressed that everything looked good. Everything sounded good. Nothing was really cracked, broken, looked cheap. Everything was done actually very, very well, surprisingly so on your end. Yeah. So you, he used to actually, you said he used real transistors and something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of these resistors I would have expected to just be resin cast and they appear to be real resistors. So, which which is a bit of a surprise because that's that's a couple bucks extra in terms of cost. Right, because he is like for, this is $1,300, this whole thing, $1,300. And that's really low. That when, is In terms of low. perspective yeah. of other people who make these packs. Uh, I mean, I've seen, uh, I think when I was talking to Viking, he was like, well, I can do it for 2,400. I was like, eesh, that's still a lot. Yeah, uh, usually about two grand is what you're looking at in terms of materials for like a full hero build. Uh, but that would also be including something like the aluminum wand that mine has as well. So you do, you shave off some of the material cost by doing a resin cast wand. Uh, it's also much lighter by consequence too, which makes it a lot easier to wear. So now we're gonna do a direct comparison. I've already told you guys out there that I do recommend Garrick if you're looking for a budget pack that you're maybe feel a bit intimidated to make yourself. I do recommend him. I am, 
I can't even tell you how ecstatic I am here until from the interview because I'm probably going to be getting. Yeah. I'm ecstatic about this pack. I'm very happy with what I got. I'm not disappointed in any way about what I received, but I do think it's educational and informative to Chris, who's like the ghost head aficionado, to kind of show the differences between a pack you spend uh, building yourself, painting, and spending $3,000 on, and a pack you spend someone else who does multiple things, not just Ghostbuster stuff. So Chris, wh when you first saw the pack, what was the very first thing that stood out to you? I think the very first thing that stands out to me is b how much softer the edges of the details so up are. Here and like down here and on, stuff like that. On the shells. So because it's a vacuum form, you can't, you don't get quite as crisp, clean edges, uh, which is fine if you know you're saving weight, which is probably worth a hell of a lot. About more. ten pounds, you said, yeah. right? Yeah, thereabouts. Yeah. Uh, but by comparison, you can really see when they're right next to each other that like mine, I have these very sharp edges on the shell. Uh, the other thing that really stands out to me specifically, specifically, is just uh, the fact that a lot of those parts are just to my eye resin cast. Right. Uh, so and like that's, the, obviously my wand is resin cast. Uh, a uh, lot of these other parts on the outside are resin cast. The things like the crank knob here, mm -hmm. the knob that actually controls your volume, right. the clipboard valve here, uh, these fixtures and fittings and everything, that sort of thing. Uh, mostly because I know what the real ones look like because I have the real ones on my pack. Right. Uh, and these uh, are the are these resin? I yeah, can't tell. That's, 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 the that's cast into the HGA. Okay. So it's the same cast. It's one, one. This solid is piece. all a single piece. Okay. So where, where yours is two pieces, right? You actually have e, a metal. Uh, so the fittings themselves are real. The HGA is a resin cast made by uh, uh, heavy props. Okay. Uh, but it is a super high fidelity <laughs> resin cast. In fact, uh, these resin casts from heavy props are so dense that they have stripped. Uh, <laughs> they've stripped the heads the cutting threads off of the heads of like uh, tap drill bits on me while I was working them. What's going on with a lot of the metal bits in mine? Uh, this, for example, this, the cyclotron that holds it in, what's this part called? Cause I don't know exactly what uh, it's called. That, that's called the bumper? The bumper, This okay. whole thing. So your bumper looks a little bit different than mine in terms <coughs> of like, uh, your, it looks like your, your, this thing here is like brass or copper. Yeah, so mine is actually made from a, a new old stock from the actual part that they used. So okay. this little thing is an obscure little piece called a pneumatic pop valve. So it's part of an old school air conditioning unit for oh, a car. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it's the valve that would tell a car air conditioning unit when the heat was high enough or low enough because it would expand or contract and pop. So, and then like you can actually hear that, I don't know if you can hear it on camera, but his is actually metal. This is resin. Yeah. This is a resin. And this is all, this is all one piece as you can see here. And Chris, that's two separate pieces, correct? Yeah, that's uh, two or three different pieces actually, because I've got the pop valve, the actual bumper, and then the screw holding it all together. And then next up, I can see just from looking at it, is the ribbon cable looks exactly the same. Almost is it the same ribbon cable, cable, or is it different? Because mine's wet. I paid for mine. I specifically wanted mine to be weathered down. Yeah, yours looks a lot more uh, nicer. Mine is much cleaner, and I don't have the same kind of twist. Uh, I believe yours is done more in the style of a Ghostbusters 1 ribbon cable, whereas mine is a Ghostbusters 2 ribbon cable, which is going to be the primary difference. You know, it'll have a different color coding, basically. Uh, that said, otherwise, it's effectively going to be the same thing, more or less. It's just kind of this cable that's run through the, uh, the ribbon cable clamp and right into the shell there. Doesn't do much. And then I think the biggest thing, oh, this is with your pack in particular, as we talked before, is your wand is 100% aluminum and yep. mine is a three, part 3D print, part resin cast. Right. And that is a lot heavier. That's what adds a lot of weight to your pack. That Even though aluminum is, is heavy, it's not as heavy as resin. It's heavier than resin or 3D printed materials. Yes, it can be, especially if you've got a bunch of it all in a compact space like the wand tends to be. It's very small differences, but there are differences. Yeah. Uh, I think probably, really, the b thing that most people are going to notice at, in a convention crowd between you and I, I'm louder. <laughs> <laughs> you do have, okay, so like, talk about the inside because you do have two speakers to my one. Yes, so, so I'm fairly certain we're probably using the same model of speaker between our two packs here. Uh, the big difference is that I have wired in two speakers so that I get that extra amount of loudness. I really wanted this thing to rumble when I had it on my back and turned it on. And I wanted people to hear me over a convention crowd, and you really can. 
that's amazing. So it's it's they're pretty close. So I mean, like if you're a hobbyist and you're and you're and you're really and confident, I was not confident. I'm not gonna mention that. I'm confident now. Now yeah. that like I mean, I've been <laughs> I've been knowing you for a few months and kind of understood and hung out with the group and like I probably could have done this. In fact, we were talking about if this if this ended up not happening and fell through, I'd probably would just build my own because I was confident at that point. Maybe I can build one for my wife. Oh hey, you know that's the excuse she's making noises behind the camera. And rolling her eyes. Okay. Anyway, so Chris, where can people go to find out more information about like just Ghostbuster chapters in general? Whether they're watching this from California, Nevada, New York, Texas, wherever, where can they go to find their chapter locally of Ghostbusters? I, I think probably one of the best places to go would be to go on the GBFans.com forums and get yourself registered on there, and go down to the. Uh, regional sub forums and see if you can find a group that already exists in your area. And then if they want to follow your group, where can they go? Uh, if you want to follow Northern California Ghostbusters, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram uh, at NorCal Ghostbusters. Uh, or you can look us up online at www.NorCalGhostbusters.com. I believe we're also more active on Facebook out of all the platforms. Probably, yeah. So Twitter, I think, it, we, uh, you just made a Twitter because I think I was like, we need a Twitter. We yeah, need one. We, I don't think we've done it. We needed to claim one. <laughs> <laughs> but you can go there to find more. Chris, thank you so much. Garrick, thank you so much. You and your wife are very talented people. I'll leave a link to your store below on your website. Very happy with my product. You guys did a fantastic job. And for more unboxings, reviews, and everything, everything cool and nerd related, just stay here right here at Shack News.